All right, so yeah, so thanks. I would like to thank you for the invitation to give this talk. So I think I have a quite uh, different background than all the other speakers so far, so because I'm mainly a Julia user and also I'm not even that experienced. So I think I got contacted because I think I was one of the very few people that run some HPC Julia things on the, the Stanley supercomputer in Amsterdam. So what I'm going to tell today is a little bit like, like my experience with, with using Julia and what I encountered and also what, what, what worked well and what maybe worked a bit less good. So it's maybe the perspective of a user that, um, that uses Julia. So um, to introduce our field a little bit. So um, so, so I, I come from the atmospheric sciences. So, so my work focuses a lot on simulating clouds and convection. So using high performance computing to learn more about um, how clouds work and, and in that way, we use a lot of high performance computing. So it's basically just um, simulation. If you look from the perspective of atmospheric modeling at the highest detail level that, that people do in the field. So you can think of grid spacings that, that approximate to 10 meters and the main size on the order of, of 10 to, to, to 100 kilometers with time steps of one second. So it gives you a little bit of a, of a view. So this type of work is very different than climate modeling or numerical weather prediction, which happens at, at much larger scales. So um, microage HSR model, so I will quickly introduce it, um, what it is, and also why, why we started playing around with, with Julia. So um, our code is, is, is written in, in C++ and also uh, CUDA, so it can also run on, on the GPU. And it's, it's written in object-oriented design, and, and it, it's, it uses quite, quite abstract C++. And, um, and it basically contains a full package of atmospheric physics. So we can not only solve the flow, but also a lot of the evolved physics, for instance, what happens at the land surface, or how do we make clouds out of water and cloud droplets and all these things, and also radiative transfer. So this is a very complete model. It's called the atmospheric simulation. The part in the end that went to Julia is only a very small subset of this. So I did not support, let's say, our whole code to, to Julia, but only, let's say, the, the flow solver of it. Important also that, that our codes are, are open source, so whatever I show you today, you can basically download from GitHub and, and try it out yourself. But then it comes to the question for this webinar, like, like why are we interested in, in Julia? And um, I think that, that Abel in the very first talk made a very nice statement about how using C++ is very lonely. And I think that also applies very much to using it in the atmospheric sciences. And, I mean, our code is quite abstract and, 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 and what you encounter is, is very much when you give it to students that, I mean, that are good in mathematics and physics, but don't have a very strong programming that background that can be quite overwhelming. And as soon as you start introducing templates um, in C++, then you get these compiler errors that, that occupy like, like 20 terminal windows and people get very demotivated. And so so we've been looking like, like can we now avoid all the, this, this problems that we, we have with C++ in a way that um, we can make it simpler for the students, but, but we don't have to sacrifice like really a lot of, of performance on that. And we've been trying out multiple things over, over the years and we've also played around with, with interfacing C++ from Python. And also that has a slight tendency of starting simple and slowly becoming really complex when you want to do more advanced things with it. And and then we came across Julia at one point because it, 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 we had this, a project where we had a student that wanted to go into the machine learning direction and tying simulations together with, with machine learning frameworks. And that was the moment that this project uh, started. And I mean, to come back to this slide, I took like an, a nice part from the, the, the famous Julia blog on, on the motivation for the code and, and what it should do. And, I think that if you read it, like the, this note that I copied from there, it, it, it's extremely ambitious, right? Like it's basically, they want to make the language that solves all problems of all other languages. And well, I mean, as a scientist also, I think we're quite skeptical by nature. So I, I think it's nice, but to me, it, all, it, it sounded too good to be true. But at the same time, I was curious to see now, like what of this, all these strong statements. And I think the most important thing is that it has the combination of being simple and being fast at the same time is, is really true. And my experience was, let's say, the, so the, the, the dirt simple to learn statement from the, the text above. I mean, in the end, if I now look back, so I worked a couple of months with Julia and to do this. And I think in the end, it, it, it was relatively easy to get the code running. And, and I think that that in that part, of the, I mean, the error syntax was, was, was very nice. I mean, the, the, the packages that were around were very super helpful and saved a lot of time. 
but in order to to make it really fast also was not that easy in my experience I had to dig pretty deep, deep on how to do that and which packages to use and how to write fast loops and but in the end i mean if, if you see that it all took like like a few months um i mean i i think we can be quite quite satisfied and then i will show a bit more about the, the parallel performance later but just as a first glimpse on uh, as fast as c so Let's say I did a very simple benchmark yesterday just to check, let's say, if we just take now a simulation with 256 grid points um, cubed and just run that on two cores of my uh, my laptop that I'm also presenting from now. What I see there is that um, the C++ uh, runs, let's say, one iteration of, of, of the simulation there in, in, in 1.92 seconds per step. And if I take Julia just with, with the things that that come with the language, like the the inbounds, to make sure that we don't apply the bounce checking and and, and this the same um, decorator, it is a bit slower than uh, the C plus so plus. It goes to two point sixty seven uh, seconds. But if I use the the loop vectorization package, which in the end turned out to be for us extremely powerful and also maybe even necessary in order to to have fast code. I mean, you see that it outperforms the C plus plus code with uh, quite a lot. Interesting thing what I also encountered, but maybe that goes a bit beyond the scope of um, this presentation now that it doesn't extend to, to all the hardware. So if I run the same benchmark like this on the Snellius machine with the, um, the cores that are in there, then, then I don't see this, this big speed of CPU stress, and they are about, uh, about the same. All right, so then um, a little bit. So what can this code now that we develop do what our C++ code could not? Because of course we had a goal in mind and, and, and although it would not, not have gone through all the work. Um, so one thing that, that, that was very nice is that um, it was very easy to set up hybrid parallelization uh, with, with Julia. I mean, in, in C++, I mean, you have to go to, to OpenMP and, and that's also something that um, if you want to go to the, uh, the built threading and my experience there that it's not that easy. And in Julia, just by relying on loop factorization and, and, and decorating the loops with the, the right things, it, it, it went pretty straightforward and, and fast. And also what we did now for this code, I mean, the goal for, for, for using Julia was to, to be able to run multiple instances of the model together and, and allow them to communicate. And of course, that's not a, a typical Julia thing. We could have also done that in C++, but given the development that it took, it was quite easy to do that in Julia um, in a way that we didn't have to write a lot of code in order to do that. One thing that was, was really cool with, um, with, with, with Julia, and that was something that I didn't even know and when we started experimenting with it, but which turned out to be super handy is the, is the macro language of Julia, so that you can kind of write code that writes code. And, and for us, I will show you an example later um, how this worked out. So, and the last thing that, uh, that, 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 that I like very much is the easy interaction with a uh, running simulation. So um, I will show for each of the four points I put on this slide now some, some more in detail examples of um, what I mean with each of it together also with some code. So to continue, so um, what I put here on the slide now is um, a little bit one of our um, message passing interface goals on how we uh, transpose data. So, so just a very short summary. So we have a very big three-dimensional grid and it basically cut into pencils and each pencil is basically attached to, to um, a set of cores that, that do the calculation on that one. And sometimes when we have to calculate certain variables, like for instance the pressure, we have to do an, uh, an auto-all operation, which means that we need to transpose the data. So first we cancel, the, we, we kind of tilt the pencil, we transpose another time and we transpose it back. And that is what we do in our calculations. And for that, we use these transpose functions. But what's really nice for is that this um, MPI.gl package um, is a very nice wrapper of uh, the message passing interface, but it also um, does it in a way that, that you can write things relatively compact. And that was really nice. Um, so you see here a little bit on the right. So, so I hope you can see my mouse arrow, but I, I showed here two times the same function. So the code is made in a way that you can, can run it either with or without um, MPI. So if you run it without, you go, um, you define kind of a, a structure that's here that is of the class parallel. And so I use the multiple dispatch here to um, define two runtime determined um, instances of a certain strict, which is parallel. And there are two variants of that. So one of them is serial and one of them is distributed. And if you have created, for instance, the distributed one, it means that you're using MPI. 
and it goes through uh, these functions. So you see in, in this function, so we are checking, let's say, whether we are, um, whether our input data is exactly the same as our output data, which means that we don't have to do anything because we're only using one, um, one process. But, but furthermore, let's say everything that's in this else class here is basically doing transposes using MPI. So that was really nice compared to, to um, C++ and it's that we could use the concise array syntax in many of the copies. I mean, of course, other languages can do this as well, for instance, Fortran or so, but what was really nice also that we, by using, for instance, these, these, these turbo statements, these rely, um, these link to loop vectorization, and there we could say, hey, they make a threaded vectorized um, loop basically here that um, copies this data in a very efficient way. So um, I think this code, if you compare this to its uh, C++ counterpart, I think it is it's relatively concise and also readable. Like we, we do a copy of MPI calls, we put a weight, and in the end, we copy our data in and we copy our data out. And that works, uh, in, in my view, very well. So if I compare the code, I'm quite happy with how much, how few lines of code we needed in the end to do this and um, how, how, how smooth the whole development went. Also, one thing to, to add to that, so um, there was also the very nice HDF5 um, package that, that, that plays very nicely with uh, MPI if you have the parallel HDF compiled, and which means that we could also do parallel writing in this code um, in a very, very simple way and much simpler than the implementation would have been in C++. And a couple of scaling tests. So, so, I mean, there are a lot of people that are quite skeptical about using high level languages with high performance computing. And, and I think that most of the codes are still C++ and C and Fortran uh, around. And so what I did was I, I, I well, let pushed really the, the code to, to the limit as, a, as much as I could. So I, um, I set up a case, which was a uh, was very convection case, which means that we're solving three wind components and and the temperature as the variable. So that is exactly what you saw in this animation that I showed on my first slide. And what we can see here is that um, I compared also the, the strong scaling. So I did, I took a 4,000 by 4,000 by 1,024 grid points case. I assign a four, let's say um, a certain number of cores and each, each um, task has four threads assigned. So that means that we have a number of tasks equal to the number of cores divided by four. So then I've tested, okay, so if I take this case and I, I start increasing the, um, the number of cores, how, how well does the code scale? So you can see that the first three steps went, went quite good. So you can see that the scaling from 2000 to 8000 cores has a 90% scaling, so that is quite quite good. And then if we push it over this, this to 16,000, then the scaling falls off quite quickly with strong scaling. So, but overall, I compared that to our C++ code and it, it, it's, it's identical and it's also not a surprise given the same operations are done in the same MPI libraries. Um, then the weak scaling is a similar story. Like, like I, I, I basically took the same case as above, except that I um, now assign you know, a constant workload to each core and I start increasing the number of cores. So the problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the more cores we use, but the workload per core remains the same. And then you can see also that the scaling is a little bit better than, um, than the strong scaling. Oh, sorry, that's not true. The, um, it's a little bit worse, but that's kind of interesting. And um, but we can do a quite quite large range here, right? So we can even go for all the way from 1,028 to 16,000 cores, and that's really um, almost two orders of magnitude in core numbers. So and, and then the scaling is about 65 percent. But I mean, it's also a little bit of um, a challenging problem because, of course, in the beginning we have all our cores contained in one node, so there's fast communication that you push it over the image. You start using two nodes that are still quite tightly connected in terms of network. And so I think it's interesting more if you could look a little bit more to the, the very large, large task. So if we take, for instance, this column here where we say if we compare 1024 to 16,000, then I think if you go more than an order of magnitude in core numbers and you have a weak scaling of 75%, I mean, that's, that's acceptable, I think. All right, so, so bottom line, with Julia, it was possible to run, let's say, an HPC job that, 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 that runs nicely Julia on each core that, that, that runs MPI properly. So I have to say, this worked almost the first time we tried it. So I was also quite curious how it worked out. And I think Julia did this job extremely well there. So then a little bit about our, um, 
are tasks. So I, I mean, this is a piece of code. I think that's not, not so easy to understand without explaining a lot more about the model, but I would want this just to show a couple of nice things we could do. So I think also what is, um, so we basically run a set of our um, model instances um, that are, so we can say, okay, we run, let's say for instance, two simulations simultaneously that is stored in this end domain. And then we loop over that in this, kind of, this is our, our main model step and for each domain, we go from the largest to the smallest. We do basically um, a set of, of operations. So we first integrate the time, then we increase the time step, and then we calculate the right-hand side of the model. So where we do, let's say, all the, the spatial operations that have in our code. And I think that this syntax looks all quite, quite, quite simple if you look at the Julia code, but what's, what's really nice, a couple of things that I want to show there, I also found this very nice uh, timer uh, package where we can just basically put a decorator again and say, hey, I want to time this part of my model. And it can also use scoping there, so you can uh, go into, let's say, deeper loops and, and, and then also see, for instance, if you define a bigger function that consists of smaller parts that, that call different functions, how does everything compare? And that's for me also turned out to be extremely um, helpful in, in, in making the code run fast because I could really identify now what are now the, the bottlenecks and does it compare to the same bottlenecks as in the C++ code and if not, then I still did something not correct in our Julia code. So to give you a small overview of that, so this is the output then of, of what, um, what, what this measuring gave me for, for the case uh, with 2000 cores and um, so you can see very nicely that if we look to the, the total time spent, so everything is in this, this loop that I just showed you and 99.9%, then of course 92% of all that is in, in the right hand side calculation, which means integration in time is only uh, less than 10% of all the costs. So it's all about calculating, um, for instance, the atmospheric flow equations. And we see here that calculating the pressure which is the part that contains all these transposes and the global MPI operation takes up 80% of the time. So we can really see also that, that a lot of work is done in the, in the transpose functions, which means that we're basically waiting a lot for the, the MPI communication. But in a way it was nice because I could compare now also the profiles of the different number of cores. And I found that say making readable profiles in Julia relatively easy compared to, to other languages that I also work with. Then um, this is another nice example. So where the, the macro function came in super handy. So um, one thing that I didn't explain yet about the type of model that we're using, which is common for very many of the atmospheric flow models is they work with staggered grids. So that means that you have scalars such as temperature or humidity or chemical concentrations of species that are at the center of a grid cell. And the velocity components in each of the two directions are on the, on the faces of the grid cells. And that, that, that has very good properties, for instance, for conservation, but it can also be sometimes a pain in the ass for programming because you have to deal with a lot of indices and interpolations. And so then I figured out in Julia that there was this nice macro language. So I, I use that in the code in, in two ways a lot. The first one is the, I made a macro that's called the fast 3D. And that's like, for instance, here. So this is one of the, the expensive um, kernels in our code, which calculates all the, the advection and diffusion and, and, and in, in the atmosphere. So you pass in a lot of, of, of arrays and a couple of um, variables. And this fast 3D then writes uh, a nested loop uh, in, in, in three directions. And also adds a lot of, of information to there. So I've been optimizing that with the loop factorization. So that's a couple of settings that you can then change only at one place and it will be applied to all your, your loops. And the only thing that, that the developer has to do then is just write this fast 3D and it will automatically kind of be uh, written into um, a nested loop. And then even more interesting, I think is this, um, this FD stands for finite uh, differences. So where I can kind of do all this calculation on the staggered grid. And I think to explain this whole part here, it takes too long, but the most important thing what I would like to, to show you is that I can basically tell now, okay, I have a set of variables that go into this calculation. So I clearly define here, let's say each of them is located at I, J or K. And if, it, if I add an H, it means that it's kind of located on the face rather than in the center. 
So for instance, there's this U here as an IH, which means that it's not in the center in the horizontal direction, but it is here at the faces. And I can write out my discretization. So this is just basically uh, the right hand side of a part partial differential equations in this way. And then my macro basically injects this into the code. And of course, this is also a terrible in, in, in layout. So I could have written this in a much more readable way, of course. But in principle, all the, the macro kind of does all these interpolations for me. And that, that is nice because it's very, very easy to make an index error in these kind of calculations. And since I don't have to use any indices in here, it kind of allows me to, to do a kind of op interpolation operations in without having to worry about making mistakes there. I think that that turned out to be very handy. So I spent a lot of time in making this, this stencil builder, but in the end, I think it saved me more time in, in, in writing out all this, this books in the code where we have to do this uh, operations. I've also tried this before in, in, in C++ using expression templates. And, and, and if I compare then the effort it took to, to make that work, it was in Julia really, really a lot simpler to do that thanks to this, this made macro uh, component. And the last part that I want to show you is um, the interaction with the running simulation. So we, I started also my, um, my talk by explaining that we want to keep things simple for, for students. And one thing that, that you would like to do is that students can, can work with the running simulation without having to dig very deep into the code for instance, they want to play around a bit with variables in the code or maybe change them or plot something. And, so how it looks now, let's say a typical user script is what you see here um, in this piece of code that I added. So I use here also this, this, um, this double, um, what his name for the science, but anyway, the, um, so you can execute them cell by cell if you use one of the, um, the IDEs and if you had the REPLs or the interactive shell. And so you can step by step go through there so you can load the package and you can load the settings of the case. So if you want to try this yourself, you can just download this from GitHub and, and run up one of the scripts. And you run the model, then you, I kind of split it out in separate tasks. So you can also then um, load the data. So the data, we do an init phase where the data is stored to this. So you can for instance, also manipulate your initial state of your model before you start it, add something to it or so. And, and then you can kind of go through the model step by step. So, so the most important thing is this while loop here. So, so it basically does, step in the model and it returns to the user, which means that you can add your own things if you would like in be, here in this while loop and say, hey, I want to store something or I want to calculate something from one field. And in that way, it's very easy to, to make your, your, your simulation kind of like how you would like to have it. So you can calculate your own statistics. You can also say, hey, I want to add now for instance a warm bubble to my field or something like that. And you can do that without have, ever having to, to start editing the Julia code uh, kind of deeper down uh, the flow solver. Also here, I mean, it was nice. I, I used it for interactive plotting or for um, calculating statistics or manipulation of the model state. One thing that I did encounter, these are a couple of uh, maybe less positive experiences. So one of the things is that the, just the time compilation asks for um, patience. And if I look to our code, let's say, um, Loop factorization is great to, to write very fast codes, but it also results in, in pretty long compilation times that, that I have not been able to solve. And I, I, maybe there's still something to learn about pre-compilation that I don't master yet, but, but I've been trying pretty hard and I did not get much further than this. And the consequence is that if I now take my laptop and I'm going to run an interactive simulation, each time I run it for the first time, so I, when I start the REPL and, and execute this cell, the first time it takes two minutes. And, if you quickly want to test something, and, and, and I mean, that, that is not, not, not a very pleasant from time to time. You always have to wait quite long. Also, the, um, the Visual Studio um, Junior plugin was nice, but also had a lot of problems with it. So it crashed quite often on me. And also when I did bigger simulations, it, it tended to get quite, quite slow and, and, and unresponsive, even if I was still very far from the memory limit of my, uh, my computer. So. In that sense, there I uh, had some experience where I kind of missed the tools that I have at hand when we work with Python or C++. Uh, I work a lot with C Lion and, and, and PyCharm, and I think, yeah, th these tools are, are are still one level better than what, what I experienced with um, working with Julia. All right, so on my next slide, you see then a, a small example. So um, 
I did a lot of interactive plotting. So here you see, let's say, a cross section through my simulation. And so this is how convection looks if you make a horizontal slice through it. And also there, I had a similar experience with the plotting. So I did some real-time plotting. And for that, I used the, the GeoMaki uh, library, which I think is, is very nice in design and, and very flexible and, and kind of supports many different things. But also there, I had to spend quite a lot of time if I run this interactive plotting to, to wait for the first plot. Um, all right, so um, yeah, there are the brings me to the end of the talk. So here you see um, well the simulation animation that I made with um, with the Julia code. So it's also on, on Vimeo if you'd like to see it again. So to conclude, I think that that overall the experience was was very nice. Like, like Julia is, is 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 easy and fast, so it it is really a great language to um, to develop in. So it's, I think that's that's also an important thing maybe of coding. Like I think it's really. A, a, language that gives you a lot of pleasure like like there's also many things can go wrong i think also one of the great things is that 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 yeah you can can profit a lot from all the great packages that are around and and for the high performance computing i think that that has been the essential ones the, the mpi one and the hdf one and the loop factorization i think they're, they're really good so that that helps a lot and and the interactive use is great but also yeah it comes at the price as i just explained it um, so overall, I, I think that this code that we developed, it's, it's, it's a nice additional tool um, with all the, yeah, with, with the stones of compilation, I would still be a little bit reluctant to re replace, for instance, our C++ and, 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 and Python things, but I don't know, you never know what, what the future brings, but uh, at least for this exercise, I think it was a great experience to work with Julia. All right, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gil. It's very interesting to see uh, more like a user perspective. On, uh, on Julia usage. Um, what you mentioned with the time to first plot, I don't know if you tried Julia 1.8 beta yet, because I found it's quite a bit faster, especially when you load like Jailmaki. Um, so that could be uh, worth a test. Okay, I haven't tried it yet. Maybe I should indeed. it. Um, and the other question I had was you mentioned that you tried it on Snellius and you did not see the, the same speed up as on your laptop. Was that a recent test? Because we've had some maintenance um, that solved network issues and disk issues, et cetera, lately. Yeah, it wasn't too recent. I think it was uh, three or four months ago. So maybe okay. I should, should try it again. But what, what I noticed is what, especially the, um, the, the, the multi-training didn't scale as well as on, on Intel process that I also tried out. And okay. I also put a couple of questions out on, on the forums and, and I think I got some interesting answers there, but maybe it's worth to look again into that. Yeah, yeah, we could follow up on that. Okay, thank you.